This is the final speaker series event in our series on the myths of public safety, focusing on parole this semester. Um, and today's focus will actually be slightly different, uh, talking about a different avenue of uh, a relief valve for people serving sentences um, or who have already served their sentences uh, in the criminal punishment system. We are delighted to welcome today Professor Rachel Barco of NYU Law. Um, but before we give you her bio and, and launch into a moderated conversation, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have seen prior events this semester, they will soon all be uploaded to our website where we uh, like to have historical records of the events we've posted and also posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can find those, uh, again, linked through our Myths of Public Safety link. And um, we do record our events, uh, as you know, so please know that if you want to ask a question, that will be recorded. We do encourage audience engagement throughout the event. If you have questions as we're talking, we can certainly pause to take those questions. We will also leave dedicated time at the end, um, usually about 20 minutes, to make sure people can ask their own questions directly of our speaker uh, and engage in dialogue together. And without further ado, I would like to now introduce our wonderful speaker um, <clears throat> and give you a bit of background. I'm not gonna read her full bio, but give you a sense of, uh, of the work that she does. So Professor Rachel Barco's scholarship focuses on applying the lessons and theory of administrative and constitutional law to the administration of criminal justice. She has written more than 20 articles um, and she's one of the leading, uh, one of the scholars writing the leading casebook on criminal law in the country. And she has written a book, Prisoners of Politics, Breaking the Cycle of Mass Incarceration, which focuses on the ways that the current criminal law policies undermine public safety and how we can get to better outcomes by relying on less flawed, deeply politicized processes and making institutional changes while also respecting constitutional law. Um, she has been a recognized scholar and teacher with many awards over the years uh, and is also a graduate of Northwestern University and then Harvard Law School and has clerked on the DC Circuit and also for Justice Antonin Scalia of the US Supreme Court. We are so glad to have you here with us today um, and want to start with kind of some landscape setting. Um, you know, our speaker series, as I mentioned, this semester has focused on parole, but today we're here to kind of pivot and talk about clemency. And it probably makes start to make sense to start with some background. So what is executive clemency? How has it been used historically? And what's the difference between a pardon and a commutation? And are there differences at the federal and state level? Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, um, for joining us this afternoon. If it's as nice where you are as it is in New York, uh, I'm especially grateful that you're indoors and doing this. Um, so executive clemency is the power vested in either the governor of the state um, or the president of the United States at the federal level. Um, or sometimes um, it can be given to like a board in a particular state, but it's executive authority to either reduce somebody's sentence, which is a commutation. So if someone gets it, it's a form of clemency called a commutation would be a sentence reduction, um, or to give somebody a pardon, which would take somebody's conviction and effectively just erase it like it didn't happen. So you would get forgiven. And the, um, there's different processes around the country depending upon where you are in terms of how you apply um, and the kinds of requirements or eligibility requirements they might have for you to get it. So for example, in some places you can't get a pardon, you can't get that removal of the conviction like it didn't have and happen complete forgiveness at the federal level, they don't even wanna see your application until you're five years past your sentence. So, you know, they want to know you're out, you've been living a good life, and then they'll consider you. Um, there's exceptions sometimes. Uh, we saw in the last presidency that he didn't much care for the usual rules, so that didn't matter. Um, but in general, there are certain requirements that you have to go through. But that's, that's what it is. It's, it's giving this authority in the chief executive of a state, typically, the ability to give relief for criminal punishment. Um, and the big ones, like I said, are pardons, which is complete expungement of the record like it didn't happen, forgiveness. Um, the second big one that most people care about is commutations, which is a reduction. There's also things like reprieve, which you'll see in death penalty cases. 
um, which is a temporary stay of your punishment. So you could ask the governor or the president to give you some temporary relief. Uh, that is usually in the capital context. So someone's facing execution, they ask for a reprieve while evidence is being looked at or some other aspect of the death penalty. But reprieves don't have to be just capital cases. Um, for, just for example, we had asked uh, here at a center I have at NYU, we were trying to get governors to give reprieves during COVID um, because we didn't want people to have to go into crowded um, facilities and risk the public health consequences. So the idea was, why not have temporary stays on, on punishment there? Um, so reprieves could be broader than they typically have been. Um, and then the last kind of form of clemency that's out there is an amnesty. Um, that's usually done at times of war or big upheavals where there's a blanket amnesty for everyone who participated, you know, in a rebellion or um, uh, kind of like just a broad scale kind of a grant of forgiveness for folks. But those are the main categories. And and part of, I mean, you, you've laid out for us, that's super helpful, the kind of broad textured uh, landscape here. But part of the kind of historical uh, piece of this, right, is that these powers come from constitutional uh, codification, right, in many cases. Um, so are there, you know, in terms of, again, broad strokes, is there a pattern of uh, historical use of clemency and pardon at the state level, at the federal level, that's different than what we see in the present? Yeah, so so it's a good point that you flagged that, um, so this was, uh, you know, for example, in the U.S. Constitution, our federal governing document, the clemency power comes right after the power given to the president to be the commander in chief. So it wasn't like the framers thought, you know, this was some weird aside. It was a big deal. And it was given as one of the chief powers that the president has. And at the federal level, for example, just to take the historical lens there, um, clemency was frequently given and very common by presidents. And when you think about, you know, the federal operation. The federal government wasn't really in the business of prosecuting crime for most of our history. So you got to kind of put this in perspective. You know, that didn't really start happening with like lots of federal cases really until prohibition in the 20s. Um, you know, before that, very few federal offenses, that just wasn't the federal government's thing. Um, but to the extent there were federal crimes, um, you did see presidents granting clemency for them. Um, President Lincoln was kind of a notorious clemency giver um, and in fact had you know people within his inner circle who didn't want to have meetings set up with him because basically if he met somebody who wanted uh, a clemency grant he was a very empathetic guy um, and you know heard somebody's story and very much wanted to grant it and so so there's lots of historical examples like at Washington President Washington um, gave uh, clemency to the participants in the whiskey rebellion so there's lots of um, really big grants uh, I'd say kind of in more modern times, if you're more interested in that, President Kennedy um, gave a large number of clemency grants for people who had been convicted of drug offenses, um, you know, kind of as the idea of prosecuting people for uh, drug crimes was kind of starting at the federal level. He had a decent number of clemency grants for that. Um, and then President Ford gave a huge number of clemency grants for people who had been charged with evading the draft during the Vietnam War. Um, and you know he set up a, a commission to help him and gave thousands of clemency grants for that. So actually, historically at the federal level, actually, I'm gonna see if I can find a slide for you that I can sort of give you the historical perspective because. I just realized since you asked about it. Um, give me one second here. Okay. Here's a, a sense, hopefully you guys can see this. Um, this is the, for modern presidents, you can see, you know, I don't think most people would intuitively guess that President Nixon <laughs> would have a high clemency grant rate, but you know, if you look, you know, he was granting about a third of the applications that came his way. Um, and again, President Ford had decent numbers. Carter did too. The drop happens with President Reagan, um, and and it really is one of those tough on crime pivots that you start to see with the Reagan administration. You know, they very much um, have as a policy that there are going to be 
tough on crime rates. The 1980s were notorious for longer sentences for people. Um, getting rid of parole in the federal system happens around the same time. Um, and so it's actually the worst possible time to get rid of clemency because if you don't have parole as a mechanism, um, there's that much more need to have uh, another avenue. Um, but that's when the rate starts to drop off. And then you saw from the slide, you know, it continues to dip. And even though you might have heard about President Obama's clemency initiative, um, he still had a very overall low grant rate. Um, if we looked at states, we would see a similar pattern where um, states had governors granting clemency fairly frequently throughout history. Um, and then the drop off starts to really happen in the last four decades or so. That kind of tough on crime era that starts around then really makes it difficult for someone to give clemency. So for those of you who heard of the, you know, we call it the Willie Horton effect, uh, which is named after a presidential campaign ad uh, against then Governor Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts, he had a furlough program that he oversaw in Massachusetts when he was governor. Um, and I use oversaw generously, like he probably had no idea it was even happening, but you know, it existed on his watch. And one of the people that was given a furlough, um, a man by the name of Willie Horton, uh, so he was like a weekend pass from the facility where he was serving his sentence. Um, and when he was out on his weekend pass, uh, he, he brutally raped and attacked this couple, and there was a political ad uh, against Michael Dukakis about this, suggesting he was soft on crime. And you know, it's uh, experts disagree about how much damage the ad actually did to his campaign, but most political pundits believe that ad was a killer. Um, and so the lesson that most politicians and their advisors have drawn is don't ever let there be an ad like that for you. Um, and if you want to avoid an ad like that, that means you can't be granting what looks like a benefit or relief to somebody and then have them go on and commit some horrible act. So clemency is exactly the kind of space where that could happen to you as a governor, because if you gave relief to somebody, um, so you gave them a sentencing commutation or you pardoned them and you forgave their record. And then if they went and committed some other horrible act, you can imagine if your political opponent running the ad saying, you know, you, this is what you did, you know, you're somehow at fault for this. And so they became terrified, most elected officials, to not have that happen. And from the 80s onward, we have seen clemency rates plummet pretty much everywhere. Not consistently. There's some places where it's better than others. Um, it helps to have a board that does recommendations that create some political insulation for, for people. Um, but particularly when it's just up to the governor or the president, the rates have just tanked. Um, and we're seeing that right now with President Biden. He's done effectively nothing. And I know the, that history of uh, of how that Horton ad resulted in, in this kind of ground shift, right, that complemented broader waves of public policy changing around criminal punishment, right, um, is, is very topical given the comments that Governor Hochul in New York, right, made in the, within the last couple of weeks about the bail reform law and explicitly understanding um, that you know that that the optics of the public perception uh, and and that the media reporting would would have an impact on uh, what that public policy should look like, right? These are still the dynamics that are affecting how to what extent reform can get a foothold and can endure. But I think uh, you know you you also make a great point about you know in our current climate of mass incarceration, right? What um, at, at the same time that sentences were ramping up, we were seeing this decrease in the overall valves for relief from long and extreme punitive sentencing, right? Federal parole eliminated, and then this big trend line shift in clemency. So in, in that context, how have long sentences and mandatory minimums contributed to the need for this kind of form of executive mercy? And how can clemency be understood as part of public safety policy and rather than anathema to it? Yeah, so I think the way I usually think about this is that, you know, no law will ever be perfectly written or um, perfectly suited to apply to all circumstances. And so in order for justice to be done, you have to have discretion in the system for some actor um, to be able to make sure it makes sense to apply this law in this case in this way. And what mandatory minimums, for example, did is they took that discretion away from judges. So once a prosecutor brought the charge and someone was convicted or pleaded guilty and got the mandatory minimum, there was nothing a judge could do 
Um, and if you think about prosecutorial incentives, they're not the ideal actor uh, to have decide whether it makes sense to apply that mandatory minimum in a particular case because you know they have all kinds of incentives to clear their caseload and get people to plead guilty. And so you know they will often threaten somebody with a mandatory minimum just so that they can, in plea negotiations, get a deal. So if someone doesn't take the deal and the prosecutor says, fine, then I'm going to hit you with more mandatories or a mandatory, and then that person goes to trial, they lose, the judge is stuck. There's nothing the judge can do. So, you know, I could give you a stack of cases with judges saying, I'm horrified I have to give you this sentence. Um, I don't want to give you this sentence. This sentence is not just... Um, you know, we see this in the federal system all the time because it's mostly drug cases and people are getting sentences of 20 years, 40 years life um, for drug offenses that involve no physical harm to anybody else. You know, that just someone was part of a drug sailing ring and they're going to be in prison for the rest of their life. And there was nothing the judge could do about it because it was a mandatory sentence. So when that happens in the federal system, um, that's it. There's no, there's no parole board, as you mentioned, in the federal system. There's no like second look that's going to take place. That sentence is going to stick. Um, and so the only way that you could get somebody to take a look at that and, and give it another eye would be through clemency. Um, the other reason that you need some kind of clemency or why it's really important is because when we sentence the person on the day, you know, that they they're convicted and it's their sentencing we don't know how that person is going to change over time, you know, and as sentences get longer in America, it gets more and more ridiculous to imagine that you're accurately predicting what someone is going to be like as time goes by and they continue to serve their sentence. So, you know, if you sentence a young person in their early twenties for something that they did and their sentence is going to have them serving decades, they're not going to be the same person. They are going to change. They're going to, many of them, they're going to, grow up, they're going to um, not in, w want to engage in the kinds of risky behaviors they did before. Um, but if there's no one to take another look at them and the person that they've become, they're still stuck with this sentence that doesn't make sense anymore. Or sometimes we as a society change. So we have people who are serving sentences today in America for decades for marijuana, which is, you know, here in New York, if I walk outside in Washington Square Park, I mean, it just reeks of marijuana out there. Everybody's smoking, right? So the idea that you're going to have someone still in prison for that is, it's really grotesque, actually. Um, but there's no measure to, to deal with that unless you have some kind of look back or way to say, hey, look, as a society, we've really changed our mind about this and we should rethink these sentences. And that can happen for any number of things. We've, um, at the federal level, it hasn't been much, but we have lowered some of the mandatory minimum sentences that exist for people. Um, so going forward, people won't get some of those same mandatories that they got in the 80s and 90s and you know early 2000s, but none of those changes were made retroactively. So you have people serving sentences that would not be authorized today. So you know all those situations require you to have some mechanism to correct injustices. And if you don't have parole, if you don't have some other second look in your system, in a lot of places, the only thing that's left is clemency. Um, you know, in an ideal world, I would have more than one way to tackle that and take the second look and look at it. But, you know, in the world we live in today, for example, at the federal level, the only place you can go is to the president of the United States, you know, which is insane. You know, no one, I think, would design that and say, you know, who should be the person that you go to <laughs> um, when we've discovered that your sentence no longer makes sense? You know, I don't think most people would be like, you know, who doesn't seem super busy? How about the president? We'll have the president do it. Um, but that's, that's who you have to go to. And, you know, it's not only ridiculous because the president clearly has other things to do, but politically, you know, the what is the, the this sadly is, you know, I, I've tried, many other advocates have tried to convince President Biden that he really needs to use this power that's critical. There's all these people languishing in prison who shouldn't be there. But, you know, I I understand the political calculus that they're clearly making in the White House, which is, I'm not going to risk anything uh, politically when I want to get reelected. And so they, they don't do it. But it's, it's crucially important to have this kind of mechanism in place. And if you don't have others, then it all rides on, on clemency.
So that perfectly tees up the next question, which is, you know, you, you've, I think, put a fine point on the way that the current system with the president overseeing this process is problematic in terms of the scope of relief and in terms of the political dynamics behind it. So you have advocated in writing in multiple venues for taking the clemency process out of the Department of Justice overseen by the president and putting it in the hands of a bipartisan board to advise a president instead. Can you speak a bit about that proposal? Why would that be an improvement? to the system and and um, what are kind of the key elements of that proposal? Yeah, so I'm going to show you one other slide here. Um, so I for the, the visual among you to show you the current process. So just in case you didn't think it was insane enough to put this power in the president, the actual clemency process at the federal level is so if you were somebody right now who um, wanted to try to get clemency, you would file an application and you would file it in the office of the pardon attorney, um, which is in the Department of Justice, which you'll recognize as the same agency that prosecuted your case. So, you know, right off the bat, <laughs> you know, if you were even thinking about it for a second, you're like, wait, what? I have to apply to the Department of Justice as the place for my... So no one would, who was designing this from scratch, would say, who should help the president decide how to correct sentencing wrongs. Oh, I know, let's go ask the same people who brought the case in the first place. But that is how it's set up, all right? So you go to this office of the pardon attorney and it gets assigned to somebody there. Um, and one of the very first things they do, if this wasn't bad enough, they go ask your prosecutor's office, hey, what do you think? <laughs> this person just applied for clemency and we wanna know what you, the person who sent them to prison in the first place, think we should do. Um, if somehow you get someone in that office who is able to overcome the cognitive dissonance and say, oh yeah, actually that was kind of a screw up or <laughs> we should rethink that, then, and, and it's a positive recommendation that says, yeah, actually I think there should be a grant. Um, then the next layer of review is it goes to the office of the pardon attorney. Um, and we've had a mix of pardon attorneys historically of who's been in that post. There's a very good pardon attorney there right now who's very committed to this process and is really excellent. Um, it hasn't always been that way. There have definitely been people in this position. Um, there have been some controversies about things they've said about the application. So there have actually been people in the office of the pardon attorney who seem to have no interest in giving pardons. Right now, it's actually a good person. So, um, so you could get through that process today um, and have a objective, I think, fair evaluation of your application. Um, but then the application goes on to another layer, um, and that is put into the office of the deputy attorney general. Um, so for those of you who aren't really well versed in the Department of Justice, the office of the deputy attorney general is basically in charge of all the criminal cases in DOJ. So it's kind of the person that the attorney general says, you be in charge of supervising all the criminal prosecution. So it's like the head prosecutor and overseer. So your application, if it gets through the partner, after already asking the office that prosecuted you, you then go to this other place in DOJ, which is primarily thinks about just prosecuting people. Um, and then someone there who has a million other responsibilities, right? So if you just think of any of the other things that might be happening in terms of criminal um, federal involvement, that's a very busy space. So your application is now on that desk and it's probably not a top priority. And that person is probably not super inclined to think you should get it. Um, because again, they prosecute for a living, that's what they do. If somehow you got through that third level, it then goes to the actual deputy attorney general. And boy, if you thought the other people were busy, the deputy attorney general has one of the toughest jobs in all of government. Um, so again, you have to kind of get on that person's radar um, and then somehow get them to agree that it should be a positive recommendation to the president to give a grant. This has typically been the place where applications die, um, either because it's too much process, it takes too long, they have too many other things going on, or frankly, because the deputy attorney general is like, oh, the prosecutor in this case doesn't think we should grant it, or I don't think we should grant it. Um, and or to just give you an example from a past administration, when um, we, we ran a, a clinic um, here at NYU during the Obama administration, uh, like kind of a pop-up shop to try to get people clemency. Um, and in the course of that, had some meetings at the 
at the Department of Justice. And, and I know one of the reasons that they wanted to say no to some people was if there was any allegation in somebody's record uh, that they had any domestic violence. They didn't even have to be convicted of it. It just had to be kind of like mentioned, if the prosecutor mentioned that they thought there was something like that, and that was it. Um, you were just denied. It didn't matter. You were serving like, you know, a life sentence for a, a drug offense. If there was like a whiff of that, they didn't want to give it because that's kind of how the department thinks about things, right? They're more inclined to say no. So usually that means you're a, you're a no by the end of that. If by some miracle you make it out of that process, there's still more because now your file goes over to the White House. Um, and when it goes over to the White House, it goes to the White House Counsel's Office. So it's going to go to a lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office. Again, another very busy place um, because they're dealing with any legal issues that the president is dealing with at the time. You know, so right now, for example, you know, if you have people in the White House Counsel's Office trying to figure out, could we use the 14th Amendment to get around the debt ceiling? You know, whatever the, the nominations, if they have a Supreme Court nomination, it's just a super busy place. Um, this is never a top priority for them. Um, in my experience dealing with these issues, you you have to fight to get them to care about this. Um, and so they, and they're, they're kind of um, politically protective of the president. So most people who go take this job, they want to be kind of, you know, close to the center of power. They're interested in presidential politics. You get very few people who go working in a White House counsel's office because they're like, really into criminal justice reform and they're focused on punitive laws. That's just, it, it, um, it's, it's rare that someone like that goes there. And so they also are inclined to say no, because they're kind of thinking of the political calculus, like would this be good for the president or not, or they're not interested in this. And so they don't pay, pay much attention to this. So this process usually means that somewhere in that chain, you've been told no, someone said no, and then you just never get advanced. But if you somehow made it through all those layers of review, um, which takes years, by the way, you probably can imagine. Um, I don't even know if they've, they may have turned this now into something that's um, computerized, but as recently as the last administration, it was still an actual folder <laughs> that was going from desk to desk um, and so taking even longer. That process is flawed for several reasons. <laughs> All right, so one is just the pure bureaucracy, right? Like crazy, crazy, awful bureaucracy. Um, and my understanding is there's even more layers now. I think there's this administration has an additional layer past the White House Counsel's Office, I've heard. So it's very cumbersome how much review takes place. And any one of those places can say no. And once they do, that's basically the end of it. So, you know, uh, the second major problem with that is just the cognitive conflict of interest, having the people make this decision, be the, for the most, the first several layers, it's in the same department that prosecuted your case. That is unusual. Um, most states do not do that. Um, I don't think if any of you were designing a clemency process, you would think, I'm going to go ahead and put the prosecutor in charge. Uh, that's not what it's supposed to be about. Uh, but that is at the federal level. And so there's just a huge you know, you don't even have to think that the person is um, biased explicitly, but there, it's a, it's a tough thing to ask somebody to look at something they've done, say it was so wrong that it cost somebody their liberty, and correct it. Like it's hard for people to live with that. So I think people tend to dig in and say, "No, I did the right thing. Like it was the right thing that I did," and they they tend not to second guess or they take it as like a personal insult that someone is rethinking what they did. And so this process is got the bias built into it and the layers of bureaucracy. Um, and we have thought, um, Mark Osler at uh, St. Thomas and I have worked on these issues for a long time together. And we um, worked very, very hard in the last presidential election to try to talk to the leading campaigns to just make this point, like, hey, whatever you're going to do, this won't serve you well as president. This process doesn't serve any president well. They, they realize that at the end, that this isn't a helpful process. And so we were trying to get people to see that at the beginning, so they would change it. And we got all the major campaigns had agreed, yes, this is terrible. We're going to take it out of DOJ. Um, president Biden's campaign did not say that until, if you all remember, there was this um, unity task force at the end that was put together for the Bernie Sanders people and the Joe Biden people. They created this Biden-Sanders unity task force. And the idea was to try to kind of show that, bring in the Sanders voters and show that um, 
that the Biden administration heard some of the things they were interested in. And that unity task force agreed that this process should no longer exist like this. It should be taken out of DOJ. So it was written as one of the pledges that that was going to be one of the things that Joe Biden would do as part of the commitment to the, the unity task force. Um, it has not happened, so <laughs> uh, unfortunately. But but there was wide agreement by e anyone who has taken the time to look at it has agreed with us. And there, I haven't met anyone who looks at it and is like, oh, that that looks good. You know, let's <laughs> let's keep that. Pretty much everyone agrees it's it's flawed. Um, but getting someone to waste any political capital or time moving it that has been another another story. Yeah, that is a super uh, disillusioning, a deep dive into the current uh, kind of state of the federal system. I think we're going to pivot briefly to talk about the work you have also led around state systems, right? So part of your work at NYU is to lead the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law, and you all had a kind of state clemency initiative looking at in depth at certain uh, states' histories of the use of clemency and, and kind of current status. Um, and so from that project, are there states or governors that currently are models in terms of the, the use of clemency? And what are some of the key lessons learned from those deep dive investigations? Yeah, so we um, we did think it would be helpful to, to go ahead and think historically about what states had done. So part of it was just unearthing a history that I think sometimes gets lost in America, which is you just assume the way the world looks now is the way that it always looked. And so, you know, the idea of clemency grants, grants might strike people as like, well, that just doesn't happen. And so we did want to show, it actually used to happen all the time. Um, and it's relatively recently that it's dropped off. Like I said, the 80s, 90s was kind of the cliff for these things. So the one we just wanted to remind people that historically this was something that was happening all the time. Um, and then try to explain why it stopped. And so by going with a few states and doing a deep dive, you can see, you know, it's all politics. Um, it's not like there's any kind of social science where somebody says, oh, this is terrible, um, or we shouldn't do this because it was a public safety disaster. It's not, it's all politics. So, you know, in each one of these states, what you'll see is um, political pressure or something about the way clemency is designed that makes it just too politically difficult for it to withstand that tough on crime era that started then. Um, and so you can see that in, in each of these states. Um, and if you don't, fix some of the flaws with the institutional design of how things were set up to withstand that political pressure, it's very hard to rejuvenate clemency. Um, but I recognize this is a bit of a downer. So I'm going to show you, <laughs> I do have another slide that is that is less horrible. Um, so here's, uh, hopefully this is, is this one up for you? I think so. Okay. So these are states. So this was, um, I admit this slide is like two, three years old at this point, but it's still fairly accurate in terms of, I'll tell you the ones that are not so good anymore. But um, so there were, there are some states that do a decent job with grants and pretty much these states are, are better for the most part because they have a board in place, some kind of um, board of pardons, clemency board, they're called different things. Sometimes it's the board of pardons and parole, you know, they have different names in their state. Um, but usually that's the key for a state doing a semi-decent, I wouldn't say anybody is like, great, um, but granting a decent clip of clemency uh, petition. So, you know, for example, and there's no like um, blue state, red state pattern here. You actually do see in red states and blue states, um, typically no grants, <laughs> but also in red states and blue states, some governors that are outside the norm and are doing better. So for example, on here, um, South Dakota continues to be a state that is a, a higher grant rate than most places. And, you know, they have a conservative governor. She is um, conservative on most measures that one would look at, Governor Noem, but, um, but she's given clemency grants even over the objection, I believe, in some cases of her, of her pardon board. Um, you know, to update this a little bit, uh, we've seen Kate Brown in Oregon has made a concerted effort to do more clemency grants, um, and that's like a big part of what she's doing. Um, my understanding, Governor Evers in Wisconsin has, has done a decent number of these recently. Um, the kind of recent year uh, big grants states with like, um, that, that they're not just giving grants, but they're giving them in 
some serious cases. So these are the cases where politically it's the riskiest because, you know, there's a there's a death. There are people that were given life sentences. Um, Jerry Brown in California um, had a lot of clemency grants for people serving life without parole sentences. And, you know, some of these cases were quite serious. Um, but, you know, very often they were cases involving um, felony murder. So that's like a group of people get together to commit a felony. And as a result of the felony, somebody dies. So usually it's like something went wrong. Like they, they meant to burglarize a house and unexpectedly someone was there, someone dies. And then all of them get charged with murder um, and get a life without parole sentence. And you don't even have to be the trigger person. You don't even have to have known anybody was going to have a gun with them. Um, you get a lot of young people get stuck with these felony murder life sentences. Um, and they're, they're disproportionate to what they did. Um, and so both California and Pennsylvania had governors who were recognizing that these were cases where the punishment was just disproportionate to what the person did, even though it was a tragic situation. And their view was, yes, these people deserve to be punished, but not this much. Um, and so I, I do think there are, these are interesting examples because these are the most politically risky uh, to go out there and do it in cases like this. Uh, and interestingly, when um, Governor Wolf did this in Pennsylvania, his lieutenant governor was John Fetterman. Um, and John Fetterman basically led the charge on this. He was really out front on this. He was the member of their uh, their pardon board making these decisions. Um, and, you know, it was a big part of the Senate campaign against him <laughs> was this, this record on clemency. And so um, this is a bright spot because he withstood it. Um, he stood by what he did. He explained why he did what he did, um, and he still won. So... Um, so it's not that this is a death sentence for somebody who politically does something like this. I think you can do it and you can survive politically, um, but it's not easy. Uh, and and so for the most part, you don't see tons of this. Um, what you tend to see more than what they did in California and Pennsylvania is some targeted clemency grants. Um, so there were things like in Oklahoma, um, for example, Governor Stitt gave clemency to marijuana. When they changed Oklahoma's marijuana laws, he recognized he could use his clemency powers to give some relief to people serving marijuana sentences. And he gave it to a few hundred people, actually. Um, so, and again, that's a red state and a red, uh, you know, Republican governor. Um, and he did that. Uh, and there's a few others like that where they target maybe it's juvenile offenses or marijuana offenses. They, they pick ones that they think, I think, are um, less likely to be politically controversial and, and do that. So there are some models out there and there's some certainly some state um, institutional models that I think are good. Um, that the model of having a board is very helpful because the governor can just say, well, you know, the board, uh, they, you know, they, they recommended it, they did it. And that does give some political cover that in most of those states where the clemency rates are higher, they have a board. Yeah, that's very helpful to know. And I think, you know, in some ways, look, it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? I, so I, one of the states that you all profiled was Massachusetts, where we are here, and our parole board sits as our advisory board of pardons as well, and, and serves that function, but for many, many, many years, wouldn't consider any of the applications pending. There were hundreds of applications pending, and not a single one of them got any consideration, let, let alone kind of a, a no vote. Um, and it was just in the tail end of the last uh, governor, right, that there were there was slight movement in some of those, a handful of commutations, a handful of pardons um, over the last year of his term after multiple terms of many governors not doing anything. And in part, there's a very particular political history around uh, the use of clemency in Massachusetts, right, of, of somebody who had been um, out on parole and then uh, accused of uh, another murder out on parole, which is an extremely rare, empirically not supported uh, reality, right? That that actually the data suggests that people who are convicted of murder and then released, whether on parole or through a, a kind of term limited sentence, are among the least likely to have a, a, a further contact with the criminal system, whether by any metric of recidivism, re-arrest, uh, re-incarceration, uh, conviction on a new violent offense, any of those metrics. Um, but I, in this case, that had a real political blowback for the parole board, which then was operating in both of these roles uh, in a really reduced way. And I think your the report that you all put out on that was really excellent. And I think part of the 
um, maybe a part of the turn in, in shifting what the parole board did here, right, and in, in kind of helping lay the groundwork for um, changing the way that that policy works here in Massachusetts. But a, a good reminder that the, the existence of the board is a, maybe an important element, but not a panacea for thinking about oh, no. know, how these politics play out. For sure, and I'll just give you another example. Connecticut right now is another state that is their clemency process. Um, they were, were giving, they were their board was recommending clemency in in cases, and there was political blowback by um, you know a few family members of people who um, were part of victim or survivor families that didn't like some of the recommendations, and they just replaced the board members with people who were not going to do that anymore and agreed to to not want to have grants and a whole category of cases just take clemency off the table. So um, it is absolutely not, uh, uh, that is an incomplete way to solve, solve the problem. And those boards often become politicized in exactly the same way that the governor, if they were doing a solo, um, if they make appointments to those boards that basically reflect those same political calculations that it's not worth it, it then it doesn't really do you much good. Um, and it's just, it's very sad when you're, because I do think some people might think, oh, but if you're in a blue state like Connecticut or Massachusetts or New York, you know, no one gets clemency in, in New York. Um, it, it's a totally broken process here. And, you know, it, for a while, you know, it, it, Governor Cuomo was terrible. Um, I could just stop there. <laughs> He's just terrible. Full stop. Period. It was terrible about clemency in particular, um, and there was some thought that maybe things would get better with Governor Hochul. And uh, you know, I know you said at the outset because you had mentioned she's been opposed to various aspects of bail reform, and she said out loud that one of the reasons that she was doing that was, well, you know, the newspapers run stories. Um, it's not. I'm doing this because of public safety. I'm just doing this because I don't want a story in the newspaper. So, you know, it's not super surprising that someone with that attitude has a terrible clemency record. Um, because if that's how you're making your decisions, the problem is there is no newspaper story that praises you for doing the grants, right? That's just like, that doesn't get covered. Nobody notices. It's not like it's something that anyone pays attention to. But if anything goes wrong, um, that's, where you run the risk and so they just make the count like you said in massachusetts one case you know i mean and willie horton um in the furlough example it just was his one case that furlough program had a 99.9 percent .9 success rate it was a really good program helped people readjust in the society um was fantastic for reducing recidivism um but you know in this line of work it's it's the it would be like if because there was one plane crash one time, no one ever flew again, right? We don't do that. We, we think about overall, what's the benefit overall? How should we think about something? That's just never the way it is in criminal law. It's, it's horrible because it is, you can't have zero risk in anything that you do. And demanding of it here means that you have people who they never get their liberty restored because no one will take a chance and help them out because they're just so worried about that that one case. And and it's not just a human tragedy, and it is definitely that, um, but it's, it's terrible for public safety. You just have people who, you know, the longer they're serving their sentence, the harder it's gonna be when, it, when they do come out um, to reenter. There's ways in which you could use this process to actually make us all better off um, as a society and have better public safety benefits. But it's very hard to get people to think rationally in this space. It's, it's pretty much a political uh, blind spot for rationality. And so you kind of have a difficult time getting through to people. You would really need someone who's really fully committed to reform and thinking about how you're gonna institute change. But if it's your kind of average politician who this isn't like their primary thing that they care about, it tends not to get, it tends not to get noticed or fixed. Yeah, well, and and to your point, that furlough program is still on the books here in Massachusetts, and it is not available to anyone. And, uh, and you know, there are people who are currently incarcerated in Massachusetts prisons who had access to the furlough program 30 years ago, right? And they are now not able to do that anymore, uh, even though they are many years older, have done so many more programs, right? At all of the, the positive kind of rehabilitative availability to the extent that it exists within our prison system, um, you know, is only improved 
from when they were able to do those furlough programs. So there's not, it's not evidence-based, right? As you're saying, um, it is entirely politically based. And I think the example you gave of John Fetterman is, is I think very instructive insofar as when they're, instead of responding to the fear of bad press by shying away from policy, it seems like his approach was instead affirmative communication about the thinking behind it, about what the what the rationale was and, and doing the kind of important public and political education about what is the policy and that that proved to have some success in his campaign. I mean, we, look, it's hard to draw data points in something that is a, obviously a multifactorial political environment, but um, it seems like that might be a blueprint for people who do want to take on this kind of work is to think about it as being, have a press strategy around what this might look like, right? Um, I want to talk a little bit about, and you know, you gave these good examples of states that have had some uh, upticks, let's say, in the use of clemency in, in recent months, but we're also looking at, um, or recent years, but we're also looking at a kind of punishment environment, right, where there are tens of thousands of people in each state who are under some form of correctional control. So where clemency is an individual relief valve, is it foreseeable for clemency to be a structural fix to the problem of kind of long sentences of punitive excess and structural and systemic racism. You gave a good example of felony murder, which is also disproportionately charged against black and brown young people um, in addition to kind of young people in general. So are there key legislative alternatives that would particularly supplant or complement uh, the need for pardons and commutations, kind of other back end fixes to uh, incarceration and the collateral consequences of criminal convictions? Yeah, so so a couple of things on that. So the first thing is just in terms of the racial disparities. Um, this will surprise nobody who has any interaction with any aspect of how we impose punishment in America. But um, the bias in grants of clemency also exists. So you know there was um, a really sobering but excellent journalistically report done by ProPublica. Um, around 2013, doing a deep dive into the federal clemency grants up to that point and showing the huge racial disparities and who was getting grants, right? It was disproportionately in the federal system. It was white people getting grants. That is not the bulk of who you see um, in terms of the federal prison population, but it happened to be, you know, well-connected people who kind of worked their way through um, congressional, you know, they knew someone who knew somebody who called their representative, who called their senator, who worked their way through the, um, and so the results were were racial bias. Um, and unfortunately, that is also something you see pretty consistently um, in terms of grants is there's, it's a discretionary process. And so it has a kind of all of the same worries that you have about implicit biases um, in terms of granting. So I should say it, it can help correct, um, but it can also inject another form of bias of who's going to get it. Um, you know, a, an example, though, of how it could be used to correct that um, was the Obama clemency initiative. Uh, President Obama, when he, uh, in his second term, uh, decided to, to pay more attention to this issue. Um, after I will say much, much effort on behalf of a lot of advocates <laughs> to, to force him to pay more attention to it. Um, he did focus on people serving long drug sentences. And, you know, as soon as you do that, um, you're going to get disproportionately more people of color because that's who was serving those sentences. And there's all kinds of bias in how those cases were prosecuted. And so his grants um, were uh, notable corrective for some of the bias that had previously existed in terms of who was getting the mandatory minimums in some of those sentences. So, so you can use clemency to kind of correct some of those things. And one way you could do it is by targeting areas that you know had some of that bias built in or flaws built into it. So, you know, there are some, some kind of key targets for that. So one, felony murder in the States. Felony murder is, um, totally racially biased in terms of who gets hit with that. Um, it's like I say, it's disproportionate. It's it's an area that really kind of calls out for, for a second look. Um, similarly, mandatory minimum, um, again, because that was prosecutors making charging decisions, judges' hands are tied. That's another space where if you're looking at um, areas for correcting, mandatory minimums are a big one. Um, and particularly where they usually exist, because it's usually mandatory minimums for, you know, drugs, and, and firearms, which also tend to be disproportionately policed in a way that is gonna bring in larger percentages of people of color than, than would be representative of their uh, proportion in the population. So, so you can use clemency as one of the ways that you kind of target the things that you know 
were flawed from the outset. Um, and you can actually use it in a in a broader way. You don't have to do this kind of individual one. So you know, so I one of the reasons that I think clemency is an important thing to look at for reform is at the federal level, for example, if if Joe Biden wants to, let's say, um, right the wrongs of his horrible Senate record in terms of being the architect of a lot of these mandatory minimums. Um, it's very hard for him to go to Congress right now and say, hey, let's work together and fix this, right? Because you're not going to successfully do that with a Republican House. Um, it's just not realistic to expect legislation to come in right now. But he has the authority today. Today, this afternoon, if he had nothing else going on, he could decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give clemency to every single person who's serving a mandatory minimum that they would not get today. So any mandatory minimum that we've already reduced, which which happened in um, during the Trump administration, there was reform for some mandatory in the First Step Act. Some mandatory minimums were reduced, but it wasn't made retroactive. He could say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to categorically give people clemency. And he could even set it up so that um, if he was worried that, well, what if there's one person who had a pretty bad record in prison or something, he'd do it where it's, it's, it could be conditional on going back before your sentencing judge. There's, there's ways you could do it to just get one last check to make sure your prison record is okay, but otherwise make it categorical. So you actually could use clemency in a bigger suite. That is what President Ford did with the Vietnam draft debate. He didn't go like one by one. <laughs> um, he set up a commission and he was able to do it in bulk. Um, so there's nothing that stops President Biden from doing that tomorrow. He could give um, categorical clemency to everyone who's currently on home confinement right now that was sent home because of COVID. He could say, and he should, um, you know what, just you're done. You're done. You don't have to live in fear that somehow because you have a crazy uh, supervision set up that someone's going to send you back for something stupid. I'm just going to give you all clemency. You're, you're all done. Um, and that could be a big categorical sweep. So, or he could say, you know, everybody who's over the age of 75 or 80, you know, like they're, they're, they're not a public safety risk. Just I'm going to get, so you could do big categorical grants. Um, with clemency, um, and we have seen that done historically in some states. You could you could do that, um, and I think it's a worthwhile thing to do because in some places you just can't get other legislative reforms passed, and you got to work with whatever tools you have. Um, in an ideal world, I don't think clemency is the best place to fix some of these things. I think that you know ideally, I think we should have in place that whenever a law is changed to reduce a sentence, it's automatically retroactive so that anybody can go back and get resentenced under the new sentence. Like that should be a no brainer. And the only people who don't get it are people who, you know, have real big red flags in their, <laughs> in what they've done since then, um, which you kind of probably would need politically to get that done. Um, but otherwise everything should be retroactive. As I was on the sentencing commission, and the Federal Sentencing Commission is one of the few spaces where when the Federal Commission reduces a penalty for something, the commission has the authority to make it retroactive. So when I was there, we reduced all drug sentences. So, you know, going forward, everyone is going to get a, a shorter sentence for any drug offense. And then we took a second vote, which was, should we make this retroactive? So it would apply to anybody who was currently in prison. Um, and, and we voted unanimously, this was a bipartisan commission, I'll add, um, unanimously, yes, to make it retroactive. We did it against the recommendation of the Obama administration, who did not want it to be retroactive for everybody. Um, but we looked at the data, and when you look at the data, what you see is these retroactive adjustments, there's no public safety hit. There's, there's just none. Um, and, you know, we weren't worried about a Willie Horton ad. I mean, someone could run an ad like that against me, but I'm a law professor. So, <laughs> you know, nothing's going to happen to me. Uh, and so we gave more than 30,000 people reduced sentences. Currently, incarcerated people got lesser sentences as a result of that. So you can set, I think every law should be like that. And anytime there's a reduction, it's automatically retroactive. That, that's a kind of no-brainer, I think, in terms of justice. Um, but I also think, even without retroactive adjustments, everyone should get a second look at their sentence. People change over time. It's crazy that you're going to make a decision. I mean, what decision in life do you make that you don't reevaluate at certain points to make sure that it still makes sense for you? The idea that you're going to sentence somebody today and give them 30 years and never rethink that makes sense 
no sense at all. I mean, it's, it's inhumane and it's resource wasteful and it's just stupid. So the idea that you wouldn't revisit someone's sentence over time is not. Um, and so we should have mechanisms in place where a sentence does get reevaluated, and you know, periodically you check in and you think, does this still make sense anymore? Um, so in addition to when things are changed societally as retroactive, individually we look at people because people, not everyone, <laughs> um, but you know, most people do change and, and they should get the benefit of that and, and we should recognize it. So, you know, so I do think we should have second looks in place. Um, I think it's important how you design them because you don't want to kind of reinstitute the flaws we've had in other processes. Unfortunately, I know you have a whole series on parole, so I, <laughs> I won't I won't go into. There's problems with the way we've done second looks before politically and how they get implemented, but there's ways to do this so that it's it's more likely. And we should absolutely have that. We should have you know you shouldn't have to go to the president to get a pardon and to get your record cleared. We should have expungement methods where you can go in and you can clear your record. Um, and some states do have that. We don't have it at the federal level, but some states do. That should also be a no-brainer. Like at a certain point, you should just be able to clean slate your record and not have all those impediments to getting apartments and jobs and licenses. You know, it's it's we're setting people up to fail for no good reason. There should be a process in place where you get rid of that. So you could have both um, mechanisms for sentence reductions for current currently incarcerated people serving sentences, and then other mechanisms in place to address people who've already served their sentences, but they're still living with collateral consequences. Um, you don't, you shouldn't have to go to the president for that. Like right now, that is actually what you have to do at the federal level because you can't expunge your record otherwise. So, you know, if you, um, there's some license that you need and you can't get it with your, your felony conviction, you have to go through that process, I explained, with the president of the United States. Like, again, we should probably set up a whole other mechanism for expungement that, that addresses that. Well, I certainly have more questions and I'm happy to keep powering forward, but I also want to update, uh, I mean, open the floor to folks. So if people have questions, you're welcome to raise your hand on the Zoom or post them in the chat and we are, we're happy to take them. I'll pause a, a second just in case folks have anything burning that they want to ask. And if not, I will proceed and give people all time to think about what their questions are. Uh, I got a question. Go ahead, tell us your name and, and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hello? I think we lost you. Whoever unmuted to ask your question, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. All right, well, maybe we'll come back to you, whoever you were. I, I didn't see who unmuted, if somebody else saw. Feel free to give them a nudge. Um, in the meantime, I have a kind of specific example uh, from the Biden administration. I know you, you've spoken about how the Biden administration has been pretty stingy on this front, but there was one kind of high profile in the press that it got example of the Biden administration's use of the clemency power, um, which was in October, a proclamation pardoning people with federal and DC convictions for simple possession of marijuana. Right. Um, and I appreciate the, the eye roll, which is a good, <laughs> um, yeah, that's good exposition to the question that's about to be framed. Uh, so, you know, President Biden's rhetoric framed it as sort of a mass incarceration relief valve, right? Said no one should be in jail just for using or possessing marijuana when he announced the pardon. But as journalists reported, I know I saw it on CNN and in other places, at the time of that pardon proclamation, there was not a single person serving federal time solely on a marijuana possession conviction. Right. And so, I mean, you you mentioned at the top of this talk that there are lots of people who are serving currently incarcerated related to marijuana, for sure. But in terms of the actual conviction of simple possession, there are no people in the federal system serving that that charge in prison. Um, but much of the national reporting on that clemency, clemency initiative kind of glossed over that, I think, really salient fact. That said, what do you think of that use of the clemency power and what are the benefits of a pardon in a situation like that? There are some benefits, like you just talked about accessing certain kinds of licensure and, and dealing with other collateral consequences, but does that initiative reflect too limited a scope and how could something like that be expanded? Yeah, that was Craven's political um, attempt to try to look like he was doing something when he did. Um, it was, I, I, it was you know, kind of, I find it outrageous 
um, I almost would prefer just own up to the fact that you're not actually going to do anything as opposed to trying to have your cake and eat it too. Um, he just did that again. Um, April was second chance month. Um, and I think he was feeling a little bit of pressure to not have April go by without having done anything. So at the very end of April, um, they gave they gave clemency to this very small group of people. And if you looked closely, what you realized is they were people who were already on home confinement. They'd already been released. Um, and they were all going to get out anyways. And he didn't even like take them off of it immediately. They have like long periods to go. And that was what he did for second chance month. But, you know, it enabled them to say like, hey, it's second chance month. And this is what we did. And with the marijuana initiative, you know, it was really it's just a gross political calculation to try to kind of appeal to young people. Um, and, you know, like, oh, I understand, you know, marijuana, uh, but it practically, so not only did it not release a single person from incarceration, um, even the people who it was, it would have been mostly people who'd been convicted of marijuana offenses in the district of Columbia, um, because he's the person would have to also, there, there's no governor there. So it has to be the president who deals with uh, district of Columbia prosecutions. Um, they didn't set up a process for any of those people. So if like the next thing you were thinking about, if you were one of those people that had a marijuana conviction, you might be like, hey, I, how, how do I how do I get this thing? There was no process, there was no form, there was no help, there was no nothing. And so for those of us who worked on the Obama clemency initiative, you know that people need help with these things. Like it's, it, this is not an easy process like where you just like online go fill out a form. You know, people need assistance for things like that. Um, and nothing was set up to help them. And, you know, and it, that wouldn't have been my top way to offer resources to people because, you know, in my mind, the people that you deal, you do triage in this space of um, criminal law and punishment. And so, you know, my top priority are people currently in prison. And so if you have limited resources to help people, let's first help the people who are incarcerated right now, who are serving sentences that are too long, they should not be there. Um, and so to use your clemency power to not help a single one of those people, <laughs> and, and he has not helped really anyone currently incarcerated, pretty much every grant he has is somebody already out. They're out on home confinement or there are these people that they've already served their sentence and they're done. But you got to give it to people who are currently there to let people know that you understand there are people currently incarcerated right now who are serving unjust sentences. And I think that's a really important thing for a president to do. That is one thing that I think, you know, I have my my disagreement with the scope of President Obama's initiative, but I very much appreciated that he used his power to make clear that was who he was worried about. He he actually didn't give many pardons because um, he did use the limited resources he had in those offices to deal with people currently incarcerated, and he focused on people in particular serving life sentences. Like the longer the sentence, they were top priority, and I agree with that. I think that is you know, you would like to be able to help everybody, but if you can't, you really need to prioritize. And the message you send when you just make an announcement about marijuana, simple possession, it just, it, it, it tells you a lot about what you're not doing. And, and I think in President Biden's case in particular, what was really disheartening to me is in during the campaign, you know, there were some moments when people pushed him about his prior record because he really was one of the worst senators. Um, if you go back and look, the kinds of things he said um, in the 1980s and the 90s, he was leading the charge for some of the worst laws on mandatory minimums and drug offenses. He was the guy. Like, it wasn't like he was just there. He was the guy. And so a lot of people pushed him on that during the campaign saying, you know, and he at one point gave a not great apology. Like, it wouldn't, it's a kind of apology, like if you were dating someone and they gave it to you, you'd be like, <laughs> you know, you got to do better than that kind of thing. But he did, he, he kind of like made the effort and and suggested he was going to right the wrong. And what's so frustrating about all of this and why it seems particularly meaningless what he said is he actually is in a unique position if he meant it, if he really meant that he made a mistake back then. Um, how many people get the opportunity to literally correct their mistakes by remedying them directly. There are still people serving prison sentences because of what he did. They're serving those mandatory minimums. And he's done nothing for any of them. 
nothing. And he hasn't even asked or pushed for legislation in Congress. Granted, that would be futile, but he hasn't even used the bully pulpit to like raise the profile, make it a big kind of a platform. So he's done, he's done nothing. So he's, you know, I, I, I'm kind of in the business of people change, people deserve second chances. I very much believe that, but you know, not everybody does change. And unfortunately he hasn't, um, he is very much still the Joe Biden of the 1990s um, when it comes to these issues. And it's, it's depressing. Um, and that marijuana was like the perfect example because even Joe Biden in the 90s was saying similar things like, well, you don't want to get the like simple possession people. But you know what? The person who sells a small amount of marijuana to support their own habit or frankly sells a large amount of marijuana to support their own habit. Like why not them too? And why are they getting hit with these mandatory minimums? But he still doesn't really see the world that way. And you know, this is this is, and he can't blame anyone for that. That's not a, that's not Congress's fault. That's entirely, he has to own that because he could do more and he's choosing not to. Thanks for that answer. Um, we've got 10 minutes left for questions and I know we had somebody who tried to unmute before and ask a question. Do we have other questions from the audience? Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Rachel. I got a question for Rachel. Yes, go ahead. Uh, are you open for any uh, any hiring to work as a lawyer at all, or are you completely retired? Yeah, I wish we, I wish. Uh, yeah, so we are a very small operation here um, in at NYU. We, it's just, uh, our center is just me and our executive director, uh, and we have no funding. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically are on a shoestring. So when we do anything like our clemency initiative or those reports we did, we apply for funding. You know, we, we go out there and, and try to get grants. Um, and we were lucky in those situations to, to be able to make a pitch to say, please fund us so that we could hire some people to help us um, because we would love to be able to do that. Um, and so with the Obama Clemency Initiative, we saw that as a unique opportunity to hire lawyers on a, on a part-time, you know, during the uh, Obama administration, because we had a vision that that clemency initiative was not going to work if it was just like a one-off lawyer at a big law firm filing petitions. It's actually kind of hard to learn how to do clemency petitions, and there's some economies of scale if you do a bunch of them. So um, mostly this was Mark Osler at St. Thomas. He's the visionary on this who had this idea to do it, um, but we ended up running it out of, of NYU just because of resources and how it made sense to do it. But um, And then, you know, Mark who runs like the best federal clemency clinic in the country, um, you know, help train the lawyers. And so we had our little tiny shop um, of like, you know, six full-time lawyers working for a year and one part-time, we got 94 grants. Um, so on a like per lawyer application basis, they knocked it out of the park. They were fantastic, um, but they were funded by this extra funding source. And then when the Obama presidency ended, the, the funding ended. Uh, <laughs> And so we don't have anybody. I wish we could. Um, and if there's other initiatives that we can think of and apply for funding, you know, whenever we do, we do calls for people to come work. But um, but the funding for any of these efforts is 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 tough. Um, I I unfortunately and and you know we had thought about doing one for at the state level. Um, for those of you in New York, uh, there was this brief moment. Uh, before he was gone, where Andrew Cuomo had said that he was going to do clemency here. Um, I'll be honest, I never believed it, but um, <laughs> but you kind of had to take it seriously because maybe he meant it. And so we were going to do a, a state one of those. We were going to hire, you know, same kind of thing, do it for the state. But before we made the investment, we did want to make sure he was serious about it. Um, and of course he wasn't. And, so. um, just to give you guys an idea, another way to get funding, is maybe holding all these dispensaries accountable and uh you know because they're selling marijuana now legally in massachusetts california and some of the politicians are the ones also investing in these uh dispensaries some of them actually own some so if you guys ever need footwork for individuals to go to these dispensaries and hold people accountable and get them to donate I'll be happy to do so because it, it is really infuriating and it just drives you mad as you think about it of how they're all profiting off this marijuana sales and you still have people in jail. 
So, you know, it's a really serious matter. To, and a lot, I know a lot of people, it drives them insane seeing people just going into these uh, dispensaries and getting marijuana while people are, you know, still sitting in jail for the rest of their lives. Like, it's really disgusting. It, it really is. I agree with you. And uh, and I think that the state efforts to deal with that so far have been pretty bad. You know, like I know they've like in New York, they tried to offer the licenses to people to sell. They, they preference people who had some kind of criminal justice involvement before to try to make it so that you got an advantage in the dispensary licensing process um, if you had prior criminal justice involvement. And I think they have had really a poor track record actually doing that so you know that's the way i think they but for the most part i think most of the dispensaries um if the people involved they have no prior criminal justice involvement they're just stepping in and making a, a ton of money and the disconnect between how how that's being treated and how we treated people before if if i i agree with i share your outrage it's, it's really awful We've got two more questions. Um, Rebecca, you're up next, and then Herbert. Go ahead and ask your questions, okay. and then we'll see if you can take them together, Rachel. Okay, hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much, um, Rachel. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Uwakwe. I just started at the ACLU of New Jersey. I'm going to be spearheading the clemency project here. <laughs> So I am actually going to reach out to you in the future. I'd love to connect. Um, I was a public defender in Brooklyn for 10 years um, before starting here. And we're focusing on the trial tax um, category. We're doing categorical clemency, focusing on trial tax mainly. So I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts about that. But I really just wanted to introduce myself so that um, you know who's emailing you in the future. <laughs> Katie, did you want me to listen to the next question? Yeah, if, you, if that's all right, because we're running low on time. So that way we can just hear them together and then we'll give you a chance to respond. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm glad we could help facilitate that connection. Sounds really impactful. Go ahead, Herbert, you're up next. Oh, okay. Yes, um, I just wanted, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you all for, these, for this series. Uh, last year, I attended my 30th class reunion at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, it's just really progressed so much. And I just want to thank uh, Dr. Susan Smith, you, Katie, and I enjoyed the presentation uh, by a uh, professor from NYU, Professor Barco. Um, I'm a prosecutor, and was, a lot of these things are very enlightening. I don't agree with everything that's been said, but today I agree with pretty much everything the professor said. And, but mainly, I just, I'm, I just like, I just wanted to thank uh, you all for all the work you're doing in this important area. And I uh, just say, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. And I really appreciate uh, that feedback. And I know I'm sure that Sandra does as well. And, um, you know, we we are really grateful. So I, I want to give Rachel an opportunity to respond about the trial tax. But, um, you know, Herbert, feel free to connect with us by email, too, if you have other feedback you want to share. Uh, and if anyone does on this on this series, you know, we're going to do our own kind of redux next week and think about what, what we're doing in the future. So please give us your feedback. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad to be a small part of this. So, <laughs> and I'm glad you agreed with a lot of it. That always makes me feel feel good. Um, uh, and for Rebecca, I think um, absolutely that. So, for those of you who don't know what the trial tax is, um, the idea would be for anyone who opts to exercise their constitutional right to go to trial, <laughs> um, that if the prosecutor makes you an offer, if you plead guilty, you know, will seek one year. Uh, but if you go to trial, we're going to file a mandatory minimum and you're going to get 10 years. That was a nine year trial tax for that person because they exercised their jury trial right. And I think that is a fantastic area to focus on for clemency because you often have um, cases where there's multiple people involved in the same offense and the people who plead, you know, get the, and sometimes they are the big fish in the whole arrangement, but they plead guilty and they get a lesser sentence and the kind of last person standing, maybe they didn't have as good a lawyer or maybe they just didn't fully understand what was happening. They're stuck holding the bag kind of for everybody and they get this longer sentence. And so absolutely, I agree. Um, that's a space where that should be remedied. 
that would be another example of why it's not ideal to put prosecutors in charge of a clemency process because you know they do like that ability because it helps them get cooperation it helps them move cases along and so they kind of see a value to having that authority but if you recognize that injustice in particular cases that is befalling on people, you really need to remedy that. And so that's why don't the prosecutor let define what, the, what they try to do on the front end is one thing, although I would try to eliminate it there too. But, but, but on the back end, when you're fixing it, I totally agree that that is an area that should be focused on. And hopefully New Jersey is a good ground for that. Phil Murphy seems all right, you know? <laughs> so, so maybe, you know, it's, it's, um, if it's possible and anything I can do to help, I would be happy to. Thank you so much. And to be continued on that conversation. All right, well, with Thank that, you. I know we have only gratitude for you, Professor. Thank you so much for the, the time today and for your work. And, um, you know, I, you are a prolific writer. So if folks want to learn more about this, uh, they can visit the, the links through our website um, to be able to see some of your scholarship and, um, again, we are taking a, a hiatus for the summer as the semester is wrapping up for us, but um, we will certainly be back. Um, and Harold, I'm definitely going to copy down your email. Or Herbert, excuse me, going to copy down your email to, to be able to connect offline as well. Um, and thank you all so much for uh, joining us for this series and take care. Enjoy the summer.